we're doing a lot of these lately, aren't we? It seems like I'm, I'm just always seeing your face on a screen. It's a bit, it's a bit like the lockdown days. You lucky thing. No, there's plenty going on, but that's because there's uh, so much activity with, with Earthshot, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're really kind of like running through a load of Earthshot podcasts, which is uh, really good. Anything really interesting you've got to talk about this time around? Oh, yeah, your polyps. No, we can't do my polyps again. We did them last time. I know, but I wonder how much they shriveled since the last conversation we had. Uh, not much, because that was only like two days ago. Oh, was it really? I don't know. I don't know what the rate of polyp shrivelage is. Come on. It's, it's, it's not so much the rate of shrinkage I've discovered. It's the moment you come off the steroids, how quickly the things grow back, which is like about a day. Does that mean you're on steroids forever or how does this work? No, you're not allowed to stay on steroids forever because they do sort of horrible things to you. I don't know if you see my eyes are a bit puffy and they do horrible things to your eyes. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't know exactly uh, when this podcast... Worryingly. I don't know exactly when this podcast will go out, but last um, night was World IP Day. So I was at the IPAN World IP event, which was fantastic, listening to um, a panel of really brilliant IP professionals and inventors who happen to be women, because um, the the whole celebration yesterday was about women in IP, how we need to celebrate their amazing achievements, and also how we need to make sure that we can get more women into inventorship. So it was a great event, but I was just conscious that I could barely see which is a, my by the end of the day, my eyes were all over the place. And yeah, I couldn't read signs, couldn't see faces. So I went home. OK, but at least your, your, polyps, your polyps weren't showing. So it's not all bad. My polyps weren't showing. Yeah, that it's might need to bad. be edited out. And we had no, no. <laughs> and uh, any ex-podcasters at iPan last night? There must have been some, some of our... Oh, people. yeah. Dr. Bola Olabisi was there. So you remember she she did the, um, the World IP Day podcast for us on the Global Women... I can never remember what the win bit stands for. Women Inventors and Innovators Network. Very good. Um, that's it. Very good. Yeah, no, and she was um, a great value, as she always is. Larger than life, amazing lady, doing some extraordinary stuff around um, networking and female inventors together. Yeah, she was um, life and soul of the party. And um, Andrew Bruce was there, who, of course, was Bowler's IP heroine as well. So really... He was, absolutely, yeah. And Andrea told a story about an elephant and a mouse. I know um, a joke about an elephant and a mouse. Oh, go on then. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And um, and in the story, the mouse, the mouse was the sort of um the minority, the kind of like the disadvantaged. Didn't necessarily need to be a woman, could be anybody, could be someone with a disability, someone who experiences kind of racial disadvantage. And the elephant was well, could have been anybody who just stamples over any, anybody with um uh, yeah, anybody with privilege who just kind of like, meanders around without a care in the world where they're going and kind of causes all sorts of damage without knowing they're doing it it's a great story work for me i've remembered the joke it's not rude i thought it was Go rude but it's not there's an elephant the mouse and the elephant no the mouse says to the elephant you're big the elephant says yeah and the mouse says no no you're really really big and it says yeah no i know and the mouse says no you're really really big and the elephant says yes i am and the elephant says to the mouse and you're small and the mouse says i've been ill <laughs> it's not that funny but it's Remember that. No, that's that's definitely being cut. Should we crack on with the podcast? <laughs> Go. Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. So it's, um yeah, as we said earlier, it's another one of our Earthshot podcasts. That's not easy to say. The organisers have very kindly allowed us to record podcasts with um, with the SEPA nominees. And today we have Paul Pex on, who are in the category of building a waste-free world. And uh, we know all about building a waste-free world because, of course, we nominated the winner last year. So, Scott, do you want to introduce yourself, recognising that you follow in the footsteps of giants when it comes to Earthshot award-winning nominees? Yeah, no, it, it's quite an honour to be able to try and stand on their shoulders with you guys, to be honest with you. So um, thanks for inviting us onto this uh, from Rick and I. So I'm Scott Winston, I'm CEO of Polpex. And we'll, we'll go into how Polpex came into creation, but um, took 18 years of uh, mastering science and deployment at Diageo before managing to transition across to packaging. So Rick, do you want to say hi as well? Certainly can do. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Rick Gordon-Brown. I'm a, a partner and a patent attorney at EIP. I've got a background in mechanical engineering, but I entered the world of IP probably some 18 years ago, actually, coincidentally. Um, and I spent some time in a couple of other private practice firms and then joined EIP as a partner in 2014. So I now head up our engineering practice group, which we call EIP Dynamics. And you know, I get my fair share of sort of full-on private practice experience, drafting, prosecution, and so on. But I've also been lucky to get 
in-house secondment experience as well through Pulpex and others, which uh, which I love. Fabulous. Um, we, are, we are slightly disappointed, though, because we are used to the fact that when EIP people come on, they usually bring um, a unicorn with them. Or um, Oh, or... yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. I've got some jelly babies. Oh, that'll do, that'll do. <laughs> He's never brought me a unicorn. Hang on a minute. <laughs> it's probably some good legal bills. But... <laughs> so where, where should we start, Scott? Should we start somewhere near the beginning? Is that Yeah, the... yeah. That, that's why I left my background kind of short to start with, because it's actually it's where Polpex came from. So cast your minds back into a world where there hadn't been a pandemic and it was just about 2018. And a few of us were sat around. So I, my, I was a chemist, originally trained degree, PhD in chemistry, moved across to food science, just 20 years ago, um, and joined this company called Diageo, who I hadn't heard of at the time, but they have some fabulous brands and make beverage alcohol. And then grew up through their technical team to be leading a big chunk of the group called Commercial Science. So Diageo is a team that looks at long range science, almost, you know, if you make whiskey for a living, then you have 25-year timelines in mind of, of how long products takes to make. It's brilliant because you've got everything from wood casking and the whole work. So we're looking at how brands grow and looking at, in the world of outdoor events, glass has been quite a problem for a while. You, know, you can't take glass many places. And people, obviously, got the plastic issues going on as well. But when you cast the, the lens of glass on there as well, you need new packaging to, to make new things brilliant so people can keep enjoying themselves. We sat there on a Friday afternoon saying, how do you get whiskey out of a glass bottle into something that's sustainable? Can't go into plastic. And so a few smart people sat around the Innovation Centre at Diageo. We said, let's make a bottle out of paper. And then we all looked at ourselves again and said, are you sure? And worked through the science for a year with some partners. And eventually, and it was almost just before the pandemic started, we said, right, we can do this. And uh, let's get this uh, out to a new company called Polpex, move the technology out and get this scaling up and going. And effectively, that's where I met EIP, when we were building that new company. And I can tell you now, it's trying to scale technology whilst trying to learn what the word COVID means in the first place. Led to a fun few years. <laughs> and like everybody else, everyone loses two years of time because no one really remembers what happened in those two years. But <laughs> not all of us were stuck at home. Some of us were running around building bits and bobs. So we were scaling up how to make a fibre bottle. So all the chemistry, the chemical engineering challenges. And I flipped from being running the science team in Diageo to leading out that charge to get this packaging technology up and online. It's the, it's the backstory there. And as we were getting the solution to a whiskey bottle online, obviously that's a solution to a lot of other people's problems as well as to how do you get replacements for packaging. And it's packaging where... It's not necessarily that any existing materials are, are bad. There's nothing wrong with glass and there's nothing wrong with plastic. And there's nothing wrong with metal. It's just that the recycling infrastructures aren't always there for them. Yeah. And you have a lot of very fast turnover packaging in the world where you have to think of this as use education of the packaging versus sh- rather than shelf life for the product. So good example, because my Diageo background, a bottle of whiskey in a bar versus the same bottle of whiskey sold in a supermarket one goes in a Saturday night in a bar, one will last months and months and months, maybe to years, but it's the same bottle. So you, you've got your packaging format, not matching your usage occasion format. So what Pulpix really is, is we're looking at the shelf life and the usage life of the product, more importantly, of the packaging matching the usage life of the product. And then you realise that there's quite a lot of packaging which only needs to last 6, 12 months. So it doesn't matter that some of the products can last years and years and years. They get used really quickly. So they've just got to get out to market, got to get through retail, got to get in people's homes. And then when you put them away and you're done with them, you can recycle them easily, which means put it where you put your normal recycling and make sure that when it gets to the recyclers, they can actually process it and do something with it that's useful so that packaging can become something new. What you don't want to do is invent something that has no re-loop, reuse cycle. So a bottle doesn't have to become a bottle again. A bottle can become a box, but you don't want to create something that has to go to landfill. And we put that whole puzzle together and came up with what is the platform. There's Polpex now. There's no, no video here. You can visit polpex.com and see what's there and see what some of the brands are doing on Polpex Home. It's an absolutely shameless advertising plug. But that's yeah, what, go for it. That's all we get to do. Um, and it really is balancing up how something works, how it looks and how it goes away and getting that triangle correct which means there's not one way of doing it, there's lots of ways of doing it and balancing up every single time. So that's a complicated backstory, but that's 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 where four years of my life uh, has uh, disappeared to. <laughs> we'll so, 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 so what, what, what normally happens now is that Gwillem kind of steams in with all sorts of really technical questions. But before he does that, because I know he's just about to do it, I want to ask the whiskey question. Because <laughs> I'm 
I like my whiskey um, and I like I, I like many and varied whiskies. Um, I, I kind of drink my way across Scotland generally. It, were there particular challenges with whiskey around sort of retaining taste, aroma, those okay. kinds of things? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's true of anything we work with. We have to work through what quality means in every single product. Quality in a detergent, quality in a shampoo. It all have different things. And that's why there's not one answer to everything. And so we took on the really hard challenges. Is You see a lot of other technologies out there that are making massive strides into this space as well. It's worth pointing out that right now, we're going to go back to the whiskey question in a second, but you know, there's 1.3 trillion glass and plastic bottles made every year wow so to replace that takes more than one person to lift all that away so there's a few approaches but we're taking the the chemical coating approach onto a fiber bottle and literally all of the chemistry has to be tested not only for say does it look good as a bottle so does it do you get your brand equity and brand representation because yeah you'll pay a lot of money for those whiskey you buy only yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely you're not going to suddenly pay less and then have something fall apart and you'll just not look good so it's got to look good and then it's got to perform well that's what you suppose it does it taste right does it keep it all in the bottle um you know you don't want this stuff leaking out everywhere and more importantly you don't want quality changing over the time you need to buy it which is interesting because you know whiskey's kept in wood and these are basically made from trees but right. it's uh right. and you know whiskey spends you know, you know 20 years or so slowly angel sharing away from the bottle and then people say it can't change anymore, but it's exactly that. You don't, you can't lose the volume inside the pack and yeah. you can't have the quality change. So we have to do all that work as well. We partner with all the companies to do it and it's done on a case by case basis and all of it. So yeah, that's, that's part of the challenge. It's not just keeping it in, it's keeping it in and keeping it right because always you're not going to go back out and spend 30 pounds on a bottle of whiskey because you're, you're just saying, no, I have glass. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Good tough challenge. Go on, go on. Here he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to um, kind of visualise how this all, all all works. So basically, what you're saying is it's paper packaging, but the coating's key. Oh, thank you. So we can see this. That's that's good. <laughs> it's really mean. Sorry, listeners. I'm holding up because Gwilym can see my video. So <laughs> oh, yeah. that's actually on the aesthetic. Interestingly, so you, if are these presumably we're moving away from glass appearance as well for some of these bottles. That yeah, you be, can't you can't see through them. But that must. Not surprising, I guess it's paper. Um, but that must be challenge number one in a sense, in terms of getting people to think, oh, hang on, you don't necessarily have to see that, you know, this can be perfectly acceptable packaging. But I yeah. guess you can get some pretty sexy stuff going anyway. You know, It is, but you, you see a lot of people, even in water bottles, you, you kind of think, oh, I can always see the water in the bottle. But look how many people carry metal water bottles now. No, that's it's completely. Through. And they fill it up themselves yeah. because that's, that's the better thing to do for the environment in their lives, in their equation, because um, they don't want to keep buying single-use plastic water bottles. So there's, it's a really mixed packaging world is the important thing. And if you look at any one thing, it comes in every format. So I've been involved with Diageo work over the whiskey and ceramic bottles, whiskey and clay, whiskey and glass, whiskey and... So it's all actually there. It's just, you're right, it, it seems a bit odd uh, sometimes when you first think about it. And in terms of the actual... Um... The, the underlying technology, there's, there's two elements. There's the kind of the, the structural side by the time of it. And as you say, the chemical coating, is that oversimplifying it? Or no, no, it's, it's about it. So the, the brilliant team I've got up in Cambridge who uh, Rick sees on a regular basis is um, a mix of engineers, chemical engineers, process engineers, mechanical engineers, chemists. It says it takes all fields of science through to soft matter physics to be honest with you. And there's even a, a Royal Fellow from the University of Surrey sat in there at the moment, just helping us with some of the bits involved. So it, is, it covers all sides of engineering sciences and chemical sciences to get this to work. So Rick, you mentioned you're a mechanical engineer, so you've had to spread your wings a bit here, technically. Yeah, I mean, I've done uh, a fair amount of work before to do with manufacturing technologies and so on, but I'm certainly not doing this alone. <laughs> I mean, we can we can talk about how the EIP team is sort of supporting Pulpex as a whole, but um, in terms of getting to grips with the technology itself, there's three of us who are seconded into the business. So Paul Flutter and I both have broadly mechanical backgrounds, but then we've got Rob Barker as well, who's a chemist. So anything that's sort of a chemical bent, um, he's the expert that picks up that. And obviously we keep each other up to date. And uh, he talks in simple terms to me so I can understand the chemistry <laughs> to the extent I need to. <laughs> I'm with you on that. It's actually a completely irrelevant call. It must take all the fun out of a barroom brawl, having just paper bottles everywhere. So, dimension <laughs> lost. You know, uh, 
health and safety is a very important part of my life and everyone else's lives as well. So it's many benefits. <laughs> so it sounds also like there's this dive straight into the patent side because we need to be talking about the IP angle. And again, so Rick, it sounds like there's quite a lot of patenty stuff going on here. I mean, obviously you can't give too much away if it's not published, et cetera, et cetera. But what areas have you seen the patent kind of portfolio developing? What technical areas? Mm. Well, I mean, the process of making a paper bottle and coating it and making it um, sort of suitable for Pulpex's customers' use and consumers is, is, you know, on looking at it through one lens is quite simple, but on the other, looking at the detail of it is hugely complex, trying to get it actually to work. I mean, I think it's, it wouldn't be impossible for another company to make a, a very rudimentary bottle, but it's just not going to be acceptable at all. So there's tons of IP, tons of innovation here in actually making the technology feasible. So yeah, huge, a huge number of small improvements, I guess, all over the place, um, really, which we've just got to keep on top on. And it's quite interesting, even as Rick, as you talk to that, because you start off with the, the, you know, the sort of intellectual process you have around the, the science and creating the thing in the, the first place, so it becomes a thing that you can actually talk to people about. And that was the work done early on. And then you get to the scaling inventions. So the next stage of it is it's great making one, then make 100, then make 100,000, then make 100 million. And you learn something new on every single step of the way through there, which is one of the early choices we made on the IP front was to, we mentioned, second a group in. Because I, I know from years of doing stuff at Diageo, it's quite hard looking from the outside of invention and working out what it is, how to protect it. And one of the views of EIP is they, they write the patents, they also litigate the patents as well, so they know how to defend them. And if they've written the whole thing, but they're also in the weeds of the work, they know the guys, they know the inventors. It's not just a piece of something's been handed over to a patent that's only to write up. It makes a massive difference in terms of then the approach and strategy you take to protecting yourselves. And it's, I mean, the IP sounds particularly important. Presumably, it's the sort of thing where you, it sounds like you guys actually, you know, I know what Friday afternoon inventions can be like. I've had a few in my time as well. They're normally fueled by a couple of beers in the pub that seem to get people going. But Presumably, once you kind of you're kind of creating a market, arguably here, you know, people haven't been doing this before. But the moment people see that it's got uptake, you're going to have Me Too coming along. So presumably, the IP side was quite important to get onto early. Yeah, it is, and especially because of the way we want to get the technology out into the world, because there's brilliant manufacturing everywhere, and fiber as a material is really well distributed as, as flat compressed board. You're not shipping water or air around too much, so this really is getting the technology out to licensed partners so they can utilise it. So everyone's going to be able to you know, largely see how the bottles are made. So the protection has to be incredibly robust around it because it's better to take on that challenge than say, we're going to create, you know, why go and create more factories? They're not needed. There's brilliant factories, there's brilliant people everywhere, fibres everywhere. Just get the technology and the equipment to where it needs to be so that you have the biggest impact on replacing carbon footprint everywhere. So that drives in that certain style of intellectual property protection, which is you know, get everything nailed down as much as you can. So should I keep going, Lee? Sorry, go on. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do, I've got a question, but keep going, Mike. I'll do one more and then you're, you're on. Um, which is just a, another, uh, oh, it's two. It's two questions, I lied. But back to the, again, Rick, so I mean, is it focused mostly on patents here? Are we looking at other IP rights as well? It's question one and two, well, how, geographically, what, what are you doing? It is a focus primarily on patents, I suppose. There, there is um, some design protection we can get as well. But, I mean, broadly speaking, this isn't just sort of day-to-day -day patent work. Um, we're sort of supporting Pulpex in sort of a threefold way. I mean, we've got our, um, we have got our drafting and prosecution team who are preparing patent applications for, to, you know, to protect the technology. We've mentioned we've got a secondment team as well. And then we've also pulled in um, EIP's commercial IP team. So they manage all the IP related agreements between Pulpex and third parties. So it's collaborators and, and, and suppliers. Pulpex work with a lot of external parties. So they've got a, you know, a decent size R&D team themselves, but they rely on experience from elsewhere. So it's, you know, it's super important to safeguard the IP, basically. We want to avoid leakage of confidential information, ensure that you know, what should rightly be Pulpex's IP does um, lie with Pulpex. So, you know, they're hugely involved with writing NDAs. I think we went through a phase where they were doing one a day for a few weeks, 
or months, um, material transfer contracts, consultancy agreements, joint development agreements, purchase order T's and C's, and it's keeping them really, really busy. Patent attorneys are busy as well. I mean, we're building a patent portfolio to protect the innovations that are arising within Pulpex and with the collaborators, also doing freedom to operate work. And then, yeah, as I say, the three of us are seconded into the business to provide basically an, an in-house IP function, I suppose, really. We report to Scott directly and other members of the um, senior leadership team when needed. And as I said earlier, this is something I, I really enjoy. Scott and the R&D team and the rest of the wider team in Pulpex, are, you know, they're very busy. They're doing their day jobs. And we're, we're sort of parachuting in to try and do all we can to take the weight off their back, meet with the R&D team, capture IP as it's made, ensuring everyone gets the advice they need and so on, and, and you know, providing the expertise on the, on the ground. So it's it's really good fun to be honest. <laughs> it's quite. Rick, a... Rick hasn't told you he's got his own lab coat and safety shoes at Polpex. It's that <laughs> and it's that yeah. level of integration. So because that's what you want to do. You want to be able, you want to work that way so they're part of the team and they go in and, and it's one of the things brilliant scientists and engineers don't often realise when they've invented something because sometimes it's the simple things mm -hmm. that actually are critical rather than the the really complex end of stuff and just having the external eyes come in. Uh, just sit in the lab with the guys, just pop down there for half an hour and just see what's going on makes a big difference sometimes. Even the adventure capture systems you put in, sort of, Rick, that's very interesting to talk about. Yeah. I mean, when we um, started working with Pulpex, we, Pulpex, we recognised the need to sort of get drafting patents quickly. There was a lot of innovation that had already happened that needed hoovering up, capturing and writing down in patent applications, basically. So, yeah, the invention capture mechanism yeah you're right it's quite it's a bit different to usual so i mean most patent attorneys i think are familiar with invention disclosure forms or invention disclosure documents and there's various acronyms for them the audience for those forms normally is the inventor they're passed to the inventor it's a bunch of questions you know what have you done what's the prior art what do you think the technical effect is and so on yep. we've we've set it up slightly differently so the audience for these forms is scott and the patent attorneys themselves who will write the applications. So what we do, again, the, the R&D team are really busy. So I or one of the other secondees will go in and basically interview the relevant member of the R&D team, capture the invention from them, fill out all the information in the form. And, and the information is basically all the information Scott needs to make a decision on whether we actually go ahead and file a patent application, whether we need to wait a few months for a bit more development, whether keep it as a trade secret. And it's also set up as a good starting point for the drafting attorneys back at EIP. So they can just hit the ground running. It's set out in the way that, you know, any patent attorney would love an invention disclosure form to look. Um, so, yeah, it basically minimizes the R&D guy's time and, and Scott's time as well. Well, my, my first question was going to be the trade secret question, because Gwilym and I learned a huge amount about trade secrets from a podcast we did a few weeks back. But you've, you've touched on that one, Rick. So I'm imagining that there is... Um, there's a multiple kind of approach to protection here, and some stuff is just kept under the floorboards. Basically, yeah. I mean, IP protection and ensuring FDO are both central to Pulpex's commercial strategy. And in terms of IP protection, yeah, the business wants defensible IP. It's got to be protecting itself from the competition. It's important to the business. It's important to investors as well. So, yeah, we are trying to strike a balance between patent protection and keeping information confidential as trade secrets we don't want to give away the secret source it's the sort of phrase we often use but at the same time if an aspect or an element of the invention is identifiable whether it's from the end product or from someone touring the factory or or yeah. whatever it might be and it's going to get out there anyway we'd rather get patent protection for it but it's for it's sure. a factor that gets um, considered with every invention capture form and the um i mean you were describing the problem earlier scott it's a global problem so I'm imagining your competition is global. How, how does that influence the patenting strategy? Makes it very broad, to be honest, because you have to just re reflect that. Um, and, and just to build off the theme, you know, patents aren't trophies, they are assets. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's even now some of the chats I've had recently, you know, the banks are starting to even put funding mechanisms in place of recognised and they can they can put values on patents as assets uh, a lot earlier stage than they would have. So putting those in, making them strong, making them defensible, 
because yeah, they do. It does add up to a, a hefty bill once you've been through the the globalization stage of the the patent processes. Um, yeah. It's it's really hard to call in early days where to go, but there are sort of early days once you got past the, the filing costs and yeah, the the cost of prepping the documents in the first place and filing them. You get through PCT. The nice thing is you can buy yourself effectively three to five years to see how your business is growing because you go back. I so say the story starts in twenty eighteen. The patents. You know, they start to grant but you know, it's a very long tail of getting them down in every country so you can almost start to remove them later if costs start to scale or something's not as usable as it was or not doesn't turn out to be defensible so you can leave yourself free to operate uh importantly to make sure you've got operating space in the future without having to own the space so yeah it's budgeting wise i think it's the critical bit as you go into this space and sort of rick paul and the team very clearly you know, they forecast the next three to five years you know, if all this goes through as we think it's going to go through so i've got it's built into the business plan and when you then come around to the what do investors want to see they don't want to see a portfolio of undefensible trophies they want to see defense how it links to your business strategy where the deployment is and actually that you've, you've costed out to do it because it becomes a very expensive game very quickly uh if, if you're not using them and, and the, the defense I mean, I, oh, Scott Rick, sorry. i was just gonna say i'll add to it in terms of trying to work out which territories to protect inventions in. I mean, Scott and his team will know the market better than we do um, in terms of where there is activity. But, you know, as you and your listeners will know, patents themselves are a really good identifier of R&D activity around the world. So, you know, you can keep an eye on patent publications from third parties and see what they're up to and where they're filing as well and where they're likely to be active. So, you know, we try and feed into this and, and inform Scott and we use our own patent analytics software called patently to monitor the party's patent activity and it's you know it's great for competitor intelligence you know you set up a watch on a particular company or whatever search criteria you want and it automatically dates when there's a new patent publication when it comes to light and we can analyze it you know for fto but equally for competitor intelligence purposes so that all informs filing decisions down the line so one of the things that I've been quite interested in is, is words that Scott's used. Um, so we, we've we've done a lot of these podcasts, and it means we've had a lot of inventive, creative people on. And ordinarily, they're quite new to the whole world, the whole experience. And I've never heard anybody in Scott's chair use words like litigation and defence on one of our podcasts before. So um, so I'm quite I'm quite interested in um, why that is so 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 kind of key on your radar this early on Scott because because clearly it's something that you're thinking about no yeah it probably comes to a background so it's 18 years at Diageo so the team was called commercial science and it was called commercial science rather than blue sky science for a reason it was science that makes money and that's the difference between academia and industry you don't you know science has got to turn back to value um and, and that can turn up in many forms it has to generate value but working from beverage alcohol you know if if we'd have written down everything we did 25 years ago and published it, then everyone would have copied it. So it's all trade secrets. Coming through to then a chemistry style background to what is a manufacturing footprint style company going forward, you very much flip to like automotive mentality, which is actually you have to make sure all the nuts and bolts are secured down. But I've still come from a background of if you can't see if someone's copied it, how are you going to actually do anything about it? It's very nice having a piece of paper, but if it's not enforceable in any way, if there's no mechanism to even start a discussion, then you actually have paid a lot of money and you can't do a lot with it. And so that's where the discussions with Paula, Rick, Rob, the broader team, is as much on that form is not so much the discussions we have is about the invention itself, but it's like, could you spot it if someone else had, had done anything about it? Because that can often be the difference between just keeping something as a trade secret, not giving the game away, and actually something that pops up and... He said, guys, I think you've accidentally done what we've done. Let's have a discussion. Um, and that's, uh, that's for me, it's just experience of, of being in the, the corporate powers of Diageo for that amount of time doing very advanced science, which is, again, that 25 years, it puts you on a pharmaceutical timeline for development of some stuff. You're already, you're already it's very good at the very beginning, standing on other shoulders giants when you're working on spirits. Someone did something 20 years ago, you're picking up their experiment 20 years later, they may have left the company. For all you know, so you rely on their notes and everything else and whatever they laid down protection wise previously to then pick up and carry on. So it's probably just my a bit of unique background and a view on that that side of the world a little bit. It's interesting. I mean, we've on the Siddle Earthshot series, we've we've talked with a range of 
um, different businesses, some very, very early stages in every sense, really just kind of the idea development stage. Um, some leading, you Lee wasn't in, wasn't in all of these because he was doing poorly, but um, one where a guy had been in a certain business for decades um, and just hit, again, just had a small sounding but really big improvement on coat hangers of all things, actually. But as you can imagine, there's about 50 trillion of those as well. So you get it right and you're off. Um, you guys have clearly hit the ground running. I mean, as you say, just have to go to the website to see the partners that you've got and everything else. And, you know, that expertise and it sounds like a lot of support from Diageo as well, which obviously is, is, is a global name. It's fantastic. My actual question, Scott, was that you've come, I don't, you didn't, I wasn't quite clear on what your role was when you were at Diageo, but it sounds like you've moved to CEO. Presumably you weren't CEO of Diageo. So Definitely not CEO of <laughs> Diageo. Um, no offense. I mean, you could well have been. I don't know. I'm just checking. Um, I, interested what's it like i mean is it a big change how are you finding it presumably it's a different it direction. is it's a it's been a brilliant massive change in terms of like stretching career so i was um if you like a senior manager was the the role title in diageo but it's leading a team of scientists and product developers and a, and a pilot plant and a small team so diageo always built itself around small internal teams and partnering so polpex is actually kind of similar small internal team that partners because i know it works and the real change up has been the you know, the titles sound grandiose, but effectively it's having the responsibility to just keep the whole ship steering. So I couldn't have do Polpex by myself. Right? It's about building the right team under you and making it big enough so it can succeed and not too big that you know you run out of money too quickly, like all startups. And it's just balancing that right. But it's not, it doesn't feel that different necessarily to what we're doing in Diageo because Diageo is a giant entity and you had large responsibility and freedom within Diageo to work. Now, it's a large freedom. It's probably all my fault. I think that's the difference between a CEO. It's all your fault rather than having all the freedom. But it's it really, you appreciate the amount you learn inside big corporates when suddenly you're kind of sort of sat at the top by yourself. So the, the, we had to walk a mile in everyone else's shoes internally in a large company. Like, know what the procurement person did for a living. Know what the sales guy did for a living. They did their stuff, but they also had to understand what the technical person did for a living. Actually, then when you've got to create that completely yourself with brilliant support, because it does come from a Diageo backing and then Pilot Light Group as well, who are another interesting group for, for everyone to have a look at and how they work with large corporates, because the, their model is to take IP that's inside a large corporate that's not going anywhere and find a way of bringing it out. Because uh, maybe a large corporate has done a huge piece of inventiveness and put something on a shelf because their business model moved away. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the science, it just needs you know, a new lens on it. Um, so working with those guys uh, very closely as well still you just realize that actually it's uh say like 17 18 years at Diageo it took a training to be able to do this and if you think of it that way around is uh it's a migration out but uh, Diageo is still heavily partnered with Polpex in every way so I'm still phone down there every week that's for sure you might, you, you might have all the responsibility that comes with being a chief exec but as I well know you also bask in all the glory when it goes well so, um, so there is a big upside. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's upside. But again, it's there is. I have to say though, it's <laughs> basking the glory, but it's your team that do all the hard work. So it's oh it's no, mine, mine, mine don't do any work at all. Oh, no, <laughs> cut, cut that one. Cut that bit. <laughs> yeah, it's um no, it's the, the the up and downside to all of it. But so there's there's now. I mean, that was one of the interesting things. What's the big growth been like? You know, coming out of a pandemic, moving into a building in 2020. There's now sixty of us up in Cambridge working there to get this done and um, at one point there were just four of us for a brief period trying to lift this off the ground and like all startups when you're moving technology up and out the bottles look great now and they're available in massive numbers now unfortunately the several zeros behind the factor that are actually needed to get some of the big brands moving this year anyway next yeah, year yeah. but actually it's amazing the change over so what, what what do the next kind of three to five years look like then what's the um so it's all building scale. This is all a massive scaling exercise. So we were, we were down at the um, the Royal Society. They call it Labs to Riches, um, <laughs> which is their focus from the Royal Society itself on the big scaling technologies. And it was interesting, even this year, they said they focus a lot on really interesting novel British technology. But now this year, they focus on scaling British technology because the inventive step is the first bit. If you don't get to that huge market impact, then you, it was just really interesting for quite a while and great to talk about. So it is, it is now massive scaling because it's going back to that glass and plastic and mixed materials future, if you've got 1.3 trillion bottles in the market this year, we reckon about a third of that can move across the moulded fibre. 
So I'll leave you about 380 billion bottles needed this year. And then a market leader, we talked about competition, but say a market leader gets 20% of the market. So that's 78 billion bottles. And obviously Pulpex will be the market leader because I'm CEO. Need to, <laughs> that's my vision. Um, but yeah, so I need at least right now a minimum of 78 billion bottles this year. And we're still a few zeros behind that right now. So it's all getting up, scaling. It's transitioning from R&D engineering to commercial engineering to deployment engineering. So it's, it's just the same themes and a really different science and engineering tapped on all of it. It's going to be good fun. So why um why Earthshot now? Where, where did that um kind of impetus come from? Interesting. Well, if we were kind of people nominated us, uh, which was which was really cool. I mean, uh, I think it's really important. I mean, to see Knopfler win it last year, and I know you guys obviously helped them massively in that through the nomination. It was to see that lens of packaging get that sort of level of scale and appreciation because you know they've got the same challenge. You know, no matter how big they are, they need to be everyone needs to be a hundred times bigger to start to make the changes needed. So for everyone to realise that sometimes it does just take a bit of time to get through the start of something to the real massive impact of it. This packaging was needed 30 years ago and we're having to start creating it now because that's the the tide turning. Um, so for me, it's just, it's getting the awareness out there that when this comes, you know, because what does success look like in fibre packaging changeover? It's like a revolution from a, packaging side of things but what i really want is someone just to go into the supermarket or the bar people don't have time to think about packaging they just need to be able to pick up what they normally buy put it in the supermarket but and carry on and so all the sustainability wins have been done and no one really notices that's what proper success in this looks like rather than having to go and persuade everyone it needs doing and that's where the big brands come in and that's where they're, they're really adding massive volume and value sorry volume of value to this is because with their expertise on top of just us getting the technology ready at scale, the world doesn't have to think twice about doing the sustainable good thing. It just happens anyway in the background. That's what the Earthshot Prize because actually just a little bit of lens on this to say, yeah, guys, this this should be business as usual. And is I mean, is the is the lens more important than I want to say the money? It's a million pound. Clearly, that's important, isn't it? But I'm going to pay for a lot. Trust me, I'll definitely pay for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But it all go back into just speeding up stuff. I mean, one of the most interesting things is you've got the core technology which needs developing, but where those extra pots of resource come in, it's amazing how much you have to just get the technology end to end ready. So we talk a lot with um, people that do direct printing. So do you, do you put labels in the bottles? Do you print on the bottles? Either way, it's not really core to our part of the technology, but it's core for en- enabling easy changeover for any brand because you put the options down for them so all these extra resource pots coming they enable massive parts of our ideas which aren't core to the, the main business fund but we can start other stuff going there's a lot of uk grants we're, we're putting together now which also get funded by EPS, epsrc and others so a lot of this helps us not have to pull money from you know government resources because we can fund it ourselves so yeah, yeah. there's massive value in that it says it is a significant amount of money <laughs> to anybody so I, I have a little role that I perform on the podcast, which is when we're getting near the end, I try and sort of bring it all together. And I, we've done 45 minutes or so, so I'm feeling that um, that we're there or thereabouts. And I always end with a, I try and make it kind of quite an interesting question. Gwilym loves these questions. He loves the bit that's coming next because he gets to answer it first and then you guys go after. So you get a little bit more time to think about this. It's really not that sophisticated this time, Gwilym. Are you ready for this? Hey, so this is the most stressful thing in my week always, Lee. Hit me. What what's your favourite bottle? <laughs> One with a genie in it. <laughs> Genies come in lamps. I, not according to Shakira. <laughs> oh yeah, genie in a bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Is Shakira, I'm not it's Shakira, mind you, but they. Um, is, is that because she couldn't rhyme anything with lamp? Nothing rhymes with lamp. I can't Damn. rhyme. Okay, let's uh, what they're thinking. Should we list all the things we can think of that run with lamp? <laughs> no, so that, that so that's your favourite bottle, yeah. I thought that's quite a good answer. my head, that'll do. Go ahead. Well, Scott's Scott's our bottle expert, so he must have seen so many bottles over the years. Uh yeah, cool. You know, when you're so close to subjects, it's hard, it's hard to have a favourite. So all I can say is I've got one that was from an internal present I got at Diageo. So I worked at Diageo in North America for a while before we moved back to Diageo in the UK. And I was given a highly decorated, yeah, individualised bottle, which was a gift. 
uh, from the team of Diageo North America, which probably means a lot to me. It's actually probably the largest Bailey's bottle I've ever seen. I didn't know Bailey's came in such large bottles. It's actually, in, I can't get it out to show you guys in the cupboard next to me. But it, it has, uh, I never, you never think a bottle could have massive sentimental uh, value, but that one does to me. So that was one that was, uh, yeah, internal gift. You don't get away with it, Rick. So you know, you have to have a favourite yeah. bottle, right? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I could be corny and say, well, we've got some EIP branded ale. So I could say it's that. But um, if I'm being completely honest, it's probably a lovely bottle of crisp white wine not, at the end not, of the week. Don't, don't tell me Don't tell me you call it E-I-P-I-P-A or something like that. That would be just... <laughs> we call it, it it's <laughs> IP ale or IP. Just IP. Yeah. But yeah, trademarked. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> he said crisp white wine, Lee. Sorry? You said crisp white wine, I think you said, didn't you, Rick? I did, yeah. Lovely bottle at the end of the week. Got to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Ed Lee, <laughs> day, you, know, you can't get away with this. What's your favourite? Oh, no, that. Whoa, no one Scott. else has ever done that Thank to me you. before. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. You're not, you're not coming on again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always ask these questions because I always know where I'm going with it. So, um, and, and I wanted to kind of try and make a link back. So... But it, but it is a genuine fascination. I love cod bottles, C O D D, cod bottles. So they, these are the bottles that have got, um, they're kind of late Victorian and they've got the inbuilt glass stopper. So so they they were stopped under pressure and then you just pop the marble in and oh, yeah. kind of release the pressure. And, um, and I think I have a fascination with them, which is where I wanted to go with this, because um, you guys may or may not know this, but by very first career, I was a plumber. And I used to do quite a lot of mains water work. So quite a lot of digging up of roads and stuff like that. And in and around Portsmouth, where I used to work, there used to be a lot of old late Victorian bottling plants. So you would find these cod bottles all over the place. And, you know, these days you chuck them on eBay and they'd make like 10, 12 pounds or something like that. But you were digging so many out that I, I could have made a kind of small amount of money on them. But the reason I started thinking about them when, when, we, when we started this conversation right at the start of the podcast is in a hundred years time, Future archaeologists are going to be digging up and they're going to decide that the human race stopped drinking in about <laughs> 2030, aren't they? But, but, because there are going to be no, you know, you, you'll have your time team in 100 years time um, and there, there will be no evidence that the human race used any kind of drinking vessels after about 2030. That would be a brilliant result for the planet if that happens. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm, <laughs> it's me and several other technologies around the world hoping to make that true. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, they, there's your picks for the future then scott you're, you're trying to rob archaeologists of a, of a future you know I've, ne I've never used that as a as a pitch technique i'm going to try that on the next time around <laughs> <laughs> oh guys thank thank you so much for coming on it's been amazing um so it's, it's a great great story and obviously wish you all the luck in the world thank with you. the um with the thank you, and thank you for inviting us on a brilliant chat to you both yeah thanks very much cheers cheers yeah.